Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Stock Market Brief Show. Today, I want to talk about and prepare people for the next big play in the markets. Now, as you all know, if you've been watching this show for a while, thank you for liking and subscribing and leaving nice, kind comments. Oh my gosh, oh my goodness. Thank you for being here. But typically, what we like to do here is not predict, but prepare people for potential scenarios in the market. And we like to look at short term all the way out to longer term. So in today's video, I'm going to show you what's going on right now in the markets, because there's a lot of people now calling out about the yield curve inverting and the recession that's about to happen. And we've been talking about the warning signal signals building, but all while being on the right side of trade, which is incredibly important. Now we're going to be hopping right into it in today's video, and you're going to notice this chart, right? If you're new here, then you've never seen it. But if you've been here, you have seen it because I use it quite often. It actually, what led us to go from 2021 into the bear market of 2022, we saw these things taking shape. The green squares right here, I'm highlighting today specifically. These are the 11 sectors that make up the S&P 500. The green ones today put in a brand new year-to-date high again, so what I'm pointing out here is we're starting to see strength in these sectors. In fact, the last three months, they're all up there on the boards. You got real estate, financials, healthcare, consumer stables, and utilities. Now, why is that important? Is because when you start to see strength in these sectors and you start to look at the cycles where you can say the orange is the stock market right over here, the blue is the economic cycle. And by the way, financials was 11 cents from hitting another high today for the year. And just yesterday, it did hit a new year-to-date high. But if you look straight down and you look at the economic cycle, when you start to see strength in these sectors, you start to have the turn in the economy. You go from late expansion to early contraction. And once it crosses down through the zero line is really kind of when you when you go through that contractionary period. Now, some might say, okay, the play is to be in these names. Yes, and absolutely. But they've been the play to be in those names. So if you've been following along, we talked about when utilities started pulling back and then we started to look for strength in all these names. But the next thing to pay attention to is what's next in the cycle, right? If we're really going to be going through, right? If we're going through the stock market top and we're going through a recession, what do we look for when we come out or come through the full recession and we start to find a stock market bottom? Now, is this just a once just a little blip on the wall that we're starting to see these 11 these sectors start to performing well if you actually look back just the first 60 three trading months of the year january to april mid january to april i did find it interesting that the top performing sector was energy and that typically resembles where you start to see a top in a cycle uh, and, and so it is really kind of flowing through this diagram here as it stands right now, which leads me to believe the next big play will be coming back over here to tech and consumer discretionary. Now, there's a lot of reasons to believe why we might be moving into a recession. You could look at various commodities, like look at copper and how much it fell, fell from the skies to where it came from right now. This is copper is the has a PhD in economics, so they say. And then you look at gold and gold's a few days separated from its all-time high, which is a very long time for the price of gold. And this is known to be more of a safe haven asset. You can even look at a uh, relative strength chart between gold and copper or copper to gold ratio, meaning that typically when this goes down, gold is outperforming copper. And when you get sharp moves to the downside, it's typically during more economic turmoil. So like I, this is the last 10 years or so, but you can see here going into 2020, right, where we did have a recession, we had the pandemic, but this was heading down for quite some time. And what are we doing now? Well, the ratio is pointing down quite a bit, potentially signaling to us troubles from an economic standpoint ahead. You can look at economic commodities like crude oil, and crude oil has been breaking down. We did, we got a little bit of a bounce today, but it kind of closed near towards the lows. So we'll probably see a bounce here in the near future, but it is breaking down. And that is something to pay attention to because oil typically tracks the 10-year yield. And you can see the 10-year yield followed suit these last couple of days. And sometimes when you see this taking place, you can look at bonds for a flight to safety. 
And bonds today were up 1.29%. And let me just tell you, this chart doesn't look that bearish as it stands right now. We've seen a compression pattern. We broke out of the compression pattern. We put in higher lows. And really, we're kind of coming into this around 100 level over here that could be a big breakout area for bonds. Now, another element to all of this is to look at that 10-year yield curve, the federal funds rate. And yes, if you've been watching this show, I've been talking about this for quite some time. Bear with me because once again, we're going to talk about the next setup and what to look for specifically. But yes, the steepening of this 10-year yield curve and moving from an uninverted state here in the near future makes sense because the Fed is going to start cutting rates here in September. At least that's what we're being told and what's being priced in to the market. But if you look back through history, when we go from an inverted state to an uninverted state and start to seep in, we ran into recessions each of those times. And then you look at the Fed funds rate, they started cutting to the point where we basically cut severely down to obviously lower levels the last times we went to basically zero. And then we saw a lot of volatility in the markets there shortly after. So are we going to see something similar? I think we just need to be prepared if that's going to be the case. So when I talk about these sectors are performing, they are performing strongly from a year-to-date perspective, but they, they also can perform from a relative standpoint too. But you got to remember, like during the financial crisis, right? If we go back to what that looked like for these stronger assets moving into the recession, well, in 2008, right, these assets did go down too, right? But from a relative, so you have XLU, XLP, XLRE, XLV, um, that's what's charted here. And you can see from 2008 to 2009 is, you can see they took some pretty se severe hits. But if I just apply on XLK to that, you can see technology the larger sector over here was down more than 50% from that area right around 2000, the start of 2008 till, till here. And that's important to note because just because they're safe now doesn't mean that these assets can't fall from the sky in economic turmoil. So I wanted to first point that to be clear. The, 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 they're typically stronger from a relative standpoint, but right now we're seeing an absolute performance as well as previously stated on this slide where they are the last three months App, like from an absolute standpoint, doing very, very well. Okay, so what what do we what do we look for here? Well, first and foremost, like we said, you're typically seeing strength from these areas right now. It was originally energy. And it is interesting that if you just look up at the cues at the top right here, okay, the cues right here and the spy right here, something interesting here is that growth names can typically lead the S P 500. And what I mean by that is, for example, for here, notice how the Qs, where it made this all-time high here in July, it put in a lower high. But at the same time, we're putting in a higher high in SPY. And then the Qs started falling down, and SPY made a significant rally back up, right, because of all of its other performing sectors, to and around pretty much matching all-time highs. Not quite there yet, but take a look at how much of a difference technology um, was from its highs. I mean, we're well off from 460 to 503. That's a big differential as the S&P 500 went through. And now we're seeing a little bit more weakness here. And it's very hard for the S&P 500 to perform and or hold up if the largest market cap names in the S&P 500 are starting to see weakness. And I say this because this can be looked at as the flip side for the next bigger setup. So if we do go back in time to 2008, 2009, I want to show you what the bottom of the market looked like. And we look at here, this is Friday, 21st November, sorry, November of 2008, the day before that hit the low for the Qs. But if you take a look here on the same date, but for the S&P 500, this was actually not the low. The SPY ended up continuing down while the Qs put in a higher low. And this divergence here tells us something very important. If the Qs are holding the heavier growthy names and we're not making a bottom with the other parts of the market, it's telling us that growth names are finding their foot or feet or footing faster than the S&P 500. And that there marked the bottom of the financial crisis. You can also look at something like semiconductors, a very growthy sector. Those also put in a higher low versus the S&P 500. So what am I pointing out here? Well, once again, if the tech, if Q's put in a lower high, okay, 
that and this put in kind of matching highs here this could indicate that we can see weakness and we are seeing that weakness right here we saw even on the shorter time frame right over here to the downside it led but on the flip to that if we start to notice strength in it and puts in higher lows before the s p 500 that could be our indication of the next big setup and there's other aspects that we're going to be able to integrate. So I encourage you to subscribe to the channel because when we do get more weakness in the markets, there's very specific signal charts and breadth charts that I look for for giving more clarification. And I'm going to share those with you right now. This right here is the NASDAQ 100 up here. And this is the percent of stocks above the 50 day and 200 day. Now, this is interesting to look at overextended levels. And if we go back in time, we just look at this. Uh, I'm going to go to the 200-day because 200-day is the big boy moving average, right? That's the big dog. And if you go down here to minus 10 and you just basically draw a, a line through the, through the chart here, uh, this is indicating that when levels actually come down to 10 and 10, this means that 10% of the stocks in the NASDAQ 100 are above the 200-day moving average. So... In other words, 90% of the stocks in the NASDAQ 100 are below it, are below the 200 day moving average when it reaches these low levels. And that is a very overextended reading if you just go back through history, right? And you can see when we got there through the pandemic, this was an opportunity to say, hey, things are getting extended. Maybe we can look to buy. Here in 2019, where we saw a lot of volatility, this was the New Year's Eve massacre going into 2019. If it found it found itself a bottom there, even over here in 2016, which we marked out on the copper to gold ratio. Remember how 2016, how we're coming in here, kind of some economic turmoil there. This didn't quite come down there, but it did come down and get a pretty substantially low reading in and around the 10% to 15% range. So that is one of overextended levels that we can watch for. And even on the 50 day too, but it goes more than that. We can look at the NASDAQ Cohen high low index. And this is put pull, pulled out for more shorter term bottoms where we get a reading below this 0 0.05 on the weekly time frame and actually get a close below it. It's marked some significant bottoms like 2019 back here in the pandemic. And then in 2022 bear market where we saw a lot of sell side, it actually caught little tiny pops and bottoms. And then it did catch the bottom right here too as well uh, where we continue to see some volatility. In the great financial crisis, it found this bottom over here. But you can see that it also found right here where we saw a pop and right here where we saw a pop as well. So from a shorter term perspective, something like this is going to help us. And then also this one here is the NASDAQ record high percent index. And we're applying a 10 period EMA. And when we get a very extended reading down here through 20, when it crosses and starts to show strength and get back above 35, it's marked bottoms in the dot com bust. Right here, it had a false signal right here in 2008, but it did end up catching the 2009 bottom. You can see over here in 2011, 2012, we had some Fed stuff going on back then. 2016, right, which we previously stated about on the copper to gold chart and how we saw some economic turmoil. 20, 2018 going into 2019, that, that New Year's Eve massacre with all that volatility. And then also even more recently, we saw the 2022 bear market find its bottom here. And then when the market started pulling in and having that 10% correction more recently going into 2024, we saw, we saw that right there that led us to a nice big rally in the NASDAQ. So these tools, they are going to help us. We have shorter term signal charts like the one we pointed out on a, a brief a few days ago where we saw the negative divergence forming and it could lead to weakness and it's leading to a little bit of weakness there. But you can also look at positive divergences that led to big rallies going, for example, into 2024. We have the Pring Bottom Fisher, and this one dates back pretty far. I'm only showing on this chart because it's easier to read. But when you get extended readings of the Pring Bottom Fisher through minus 30, you can see over here both the green and the blue line. The blue line is the bottom fissure. The 10 is the EMA. When they both cross below this and then they start to cross up through it, that's when we can mark off potential bottoms. And you can see it marked the 2022 bear market bottom, and it also marked the pandemic bottom there too as well. So that is kind of what we're going to be looking for as far as the next big play goes. If this continues to follow its path, I'd be very, very focused in on watching how technology stocks, not saying that we've reached a bottom yet by any means, right? But these are the names that are going to start performing better. And that's what we need to really 
hone in on the individual sectors of technology, right? Technology has subsectors. You have software, you have semis, you have all kinds of other aspects. And we're going to be paying a lot of attention to that when the time comes. But this is more just kind of a broad, broad view of what it is that I'm, I'm talking about here. Let's go ahead and now get a little bit more tactical because there's going to be other ways that we approach this market. And this is stuff that I hone in on to st help with risk management a little bit better. Here's the chart of the SPY on the daily time frame. We cracked through this volume weighted average price that seems to be important because it was this big gap up anchor volume weighted average price. And when we close below it, it did so with some fury over here. So if we start to get continued sell side, I'd be watching the lower swing low anchored volume weighted average price as a level of interest to pay attention to, which lines up with this gap fill as it stands. But remember, we can snap back up. And then if we do, we'd start to see where this anchor volume weighted average price is. And if we start to reclaim it or if it starts to act as a potential resistance. When we zoom in and look at the five day moving average, Everything right now is showing pretty much a bearish trend. By everything, I mean the SPY, Q, IWM, semiconductors, biotech, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average, albeit Dow Jones Industrial Average is fairly new to turning over as it stands. So when this is the case, if you're trying to protect capital, you don't really want to go long in these times unless if you really know what you're doing and you're being a tactical player in this. If you are looking to catch the larger trend to the upside, you want the five-day moving average to flatten out right? For price to recoup it and for it to start calculating up, which would turn green here on the charts. That's when price is above it and the five-day moving out and calculation is moving up on a daily basis. Another thing we pay attention to is that gamma flip line, which now is at 55.70. When we're below it, we've stated, which we've been below it now for two days, and you can look at the other times it was been below it. What typically happens in these situations is volatility increases. Look at the last two days. Volatility increased. So is it going to come in a little bit? Is it going to take off further? That's to be determined. But as it stands, we're below a gamma flip line, which means that dealers can sell into selling. They buy into buying, right? Liquidity typically dries up and volatility increases. So yeah, it doesn't mean that we can't see some massive snapbacks. And that's why we got to just be more tactical in our approach in this environment. If we want to hone this in a little bit more, as far as the VIX goes, you can look at back month versus three front month volatility. And here you can see that when they come up to around, so this up this 1.2 reading means that back month, three month volatility, it's 20% higher than front month volatility. And this can mark sometimes tops in the market or areas where price starts to consolidate. Um, most recently it was here just going into uh, September and you can see the market started to top out a little bit. We pointed this one out. And more recently on the lower side was when we had the, kind of unwind, yen carry trade, all this news, but we got this deep, deep low reading here very quick. And we started to talk about that, that this is where you can find potential bottoms. More specifically, we looked for, instead of just jumping into this, we looked for follow through days, which was that day right here to start adding more money in to the market. Okay. So the reason why I'm pointing this out now is because it's starting to come off, but it still has a ways to go kind of find what's a low point. It doesn't have to reach down here, but that would indicate to me if we do come into these levels, like recently, right? Like over here, right? It started to bottom out a little bit. Over here, it started to doodle around and bottom out a little bit. Even over here, we started to kind of doodle around and bottom around a little bit there. So that would be a level to watch if you're looking for from an, kind of an overextended perspective. Now let's get into the 15 minute time frame to get a little bit more tactical, we're just going into tomorrow's trade, right? We look big picture, look to what to look for, right? And now we're kind of getting a little bit more tactical here. The 15 minute time frame, the daily expected move is the upper level is 555. I'm just going to round up. So 55550. And then below us is 54645. You can mark those on your screen. If you think of this in terms of a distribution curve, right? 68% of the time, it finishes within kind of these ranges. These ranges are not just me putting them in here. This is based off of implied volatility from the options market for SPY, right? These are a lot of money that's being traded. This is the risk that they see going into tomorrow's trading session for tomorrow. The weekly expected move is this is the lower weekly expected move, and we're below it. And this is a little bit of a cause for concern because we still have big data coming out. We have data coming out tomorrow and the next day. So so keep in mind that volatility is elevated here. Uh, I don't have a chart of the VVIX in front of me, but the VVIX is elevated, which leads me to, be, leads me to believe that these 
these market participants, they're hedging greatly for risk up ahead. So this means we can see a, a, a large move to the downside, large move to the upside. If we start to get that price action to the downside, like I said, I'm being paying attention to these lower levels and you could pair that with the lower monthly expected move. But if we start getting rips to the upside, I'd be looking at that declining five-day moving average and also back into the weekly expected move. That's kind of where I would determine where we can play into these various levels. That's all I got for you on today's Market Brief episode. Like I said, if you haven't done so already, make sure to subscribe to the channel, like the content, leave me a comment. And that's all I got. See you later.